Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be talking to you about four-wave mixing. I'll describe what it is in a nutshell. Then I'll discuss the theory which requires some prerequisite discussion of harmonic generation in a chi-2 nonlinearity. Then I'll move into chi-3 nonlinearity which is essential and part of the process of four-wave mixing. And I'll discuss the important requirement of phase matching for four-wave mixing. Then I'll move to discuss one application in detail, single photon production. And then I'll just give a quick listing of some broad applications that four-wave mixing is used for. So four-wave mixing in a nutshell, it's a special arrangement of signal, idler, and two pump photons at frequencies that are specially calibrated to a chi-3 nonlinear medium. And it's capable of photon production at a frequency far removed from the input signal. Looking at theory, let's start with a chi-2 nonlinearity. So a susceptibility which is nonlinear in the electric field will produce integer harmonics of the applied frequency. You can understand this by looking at a simple animation like this. Suppose an electron is in an anharmonic potential and exposed to an electric field oscillating in blue here at some fundamental frequency. The Fourier series of its motion is going to be that fundamental motion plus higher and higher terms. The next higher term will be a term oscillating at twice the frequency and that double frequency oscillation of that electron will, as it accelerates, generate electric field emissions at twice the frequency. Well, let's look at this in a little more detail. Suppose we have a nonlinear polarization and we have successively higher and higher order terms. We have a chi-2 uh, nonlinearity that would be captured by a tensor of rank 2, a chi-3 nonlinearity of a tensor of rank 3, but in the simplest case Let's look at a chi-2 nonlinearity of a scalar field, uniformly polarized, so it's just a scalar number. It's the field squared, it's not a tensor or anything. So if we look at this squared field, suppose we input a trial frequency omega naught into our chi-2 nonlinearity. That trial frequency is a cosine function, it's just the sum of the forward and backward rotating waves. But those backward and rotating waves, as we square them, will introduce cross terms which will generate frequencies at twice the input frequency. Those frequencies are known as the second harmonics and also uh, zero frequencies. That's the optical rectification term. So just looking at this schematically, we send in an electric field with omega naught. We send it through the chi-2 nonlinearity. We get a polarization with two omega naught. But that polarization will backfeed through Maxwell's equations to cause again an electric field of frequency 2 omega naught, which sent through the polarization again will cause, sent through the crystal again will cause a polarization of 4 omega naught, etc. So we're kind of in an endless loop here. So we might ask ourselves, can we maybe consider, say, just two frequency modes that are present and try to close this system? So if we send two frequency modes into the chi 2 nonlinearity, we'll get the sum and difference of the two frequency modes, all these terms shown here and we ask ourselves can we insert a self-consistent configuration of field frequencies and relative strengths that keeps the system closed and in fact we can if we just say that we have frequencies omega 1 and omega 2 where omega 2 is twice omega 1 and also the amplitude of E1 is much greater than E2 then this closes in a sense because the 2 omega 1 term is it's accounted for 2 omega 1 is omega 2 the difference term is accounted for because omega 2 minus omega 1 is omega 1. And the, uh, the next higher terms are way too fast oscillating and in the rotating wave approximation have very weak influence on the evolution. How does this look quantum mechanically? We can also look at this quantum mechanically. If we look at the Hamiltonian semi-classically, if we look at the subspace of our modes of interest, and we look at creation and annihilation operators for the two frequencies that we've considered, to first order, the Hamiltonian of the free radiation field in the presence of the chi-2 nonlinearity will be perturbed to have triplets of creation and annihilation operators in those modes. Terms that look like this, uh, triple creation of mode of one frequency or double creation of one mode with annihilation of the mode of an another frequency. But time-dependent perturbation theory tells us that the perturbation will couple to first order predominantly states which conserve energy. So terms such as where the first frequency, two photons of the first frequency are created while one of the second frequency is annihilated, or vice versa. So what does it look like? Here's an animation of this unfolding. A frequency 
of omega-1 comes in and frequency omega-2, that's twice omega-1, is generated at the output. So now let's look at a chi-3 nonlinearity and four-wave mixing. Suppose we have a chi-3 nonlinearity. This is a nonlinearity in the polarization that's proportional to the field cubed. And let's say we try to generate a closed system. So we suppose that our crystal is a superposition of only three modes. If three modes go into the polarization, the cross terms will generate, uh, go into the crystal, the cross terms will generate polarization that's the sum and difference of any combination of those three frequencies. And again, we ask ourselves, can we assert a self-consistent set of field frequencies? We say only these frequencies are present and do our analysis, and they're present with relative strengths. And can we do this in a way that keeps the system closed? And again, yes, we can. If we say that we have three frequencies present, two that are very weak, omega-1 and omega-2, are much weaker than the mode of frequency omega-3. And also omega-1 plus omega-2 is two times omega-3. Then if we look at all these terms, well, these top two terms are extremely weak because they're proportional to the cube of the weak fields. These next terms are moderate in strength, but they're accounted for because 2 omega-3 minus omega-1 is omega-2, and 2 omega-3 minus omega-2 is omega-1. And then the next higher terms are very fast oscillations that in the rotating wave approximation we can neglect. So these are, uh, in professionally, they're called the source, the idler, and the pump frequencies. So you have the picture looks like this. You have a crystal, and you have a source frequent photon coming in in the presence of two pump photons. And the process can simultaneously create two pump photons, well, annihilate two pump photons while a source and an idler photon is created. If we actually solve this closed system analytically, we'll be looking at a set of discrete modes at very substantially different frequencies. So we have to be careful when we do our analysis to count for the frequency dependence of the refractive index of the medium. And we'll solve an equation like this, a wave equation with polarization, but again being very cautious to recognize that this k value here depends on the frequency of the mode under consideration. When we go through all the analysis, which I'm not going to do here, we get three coupled equations for the z propagation of the fields through the crystal. And for example, for one of the weak fields, we see that it propagates in the z direction uh, by three modifying terms, three types of modifying terms. The first term is the self-modulation. This is how the field itself affects its own propagation through the, in the background of the chi-3 crystal. Then we have cross-modulation terms. This is how the other two fields affect the propagation of this field uh, through the chi-3 crystal. And then we have the important last term. This is the four-wave mixing term. This is how the E3 and E2 fields affect the propagation of E1 through the crystal. But very importantly, it's proportional to this term at the end that has this delta K value. And it, the propagation characteristics will be drastically influenced by what this delta K is. So if we say that delta K has to be equal to zero to get the propagation effects we want, this is called the phase matching condition of the crystal. It's saying that we have to consider frequencies whose refractive indices obey this relationship that this delta k value becomes zero. When this is all satisfied, we have something like this. In the presence of the pump, we can have at the incident side of the crystal, we can have no idler field, and we can have a source field applied. And miraculously, at the end of the crystal, there'll be an idler field generated at a frequency much different than that input frequency. So let's look at an application of this, single photon production, which I'll look at in detail. So this is based on a paper in 2009, where it's shown that an efficient, well-directional, single for photon source can be realized via a four-wave mixing process in a cavity. At the time of this publication, for some context, the only existing methods for single photon production were heralding and photon pair production, two-photon destructive interference, and single microscopic emitters, which had the disadvantages of very random photon production and extremely precise control demands. So the system's constructed as follows. We start with a chi-3 crystal in a cavity, and we apply a pump field that's on axis and on cavity resonance, so there's a high Q factor. But we apply a source field, and we maintain this source field 
off axis. And an idler field will be induced according to the four wave mixing criteria of phase matching in the opposite propagation direction as the source field. Then we turn the pump off and we ask how does this system now evolve? Well, if we do a quantum mechanical analysis and we treat the source field as a constant amplitude modifying the Hamiltonian, we can obtain an effective Hamiltonian for the pump and idler radiation system in the effective picture, in the interaction picture. So that effective interaction Hamiltonian, interesting, looks exactly like spontaneous parametric down conversion and two photon annihilation processes present. So that means there's a term where two of the pump photons are created and one of the idler photons is annihilated or vice versa. One idler photon can be created and two pump photons annihilated. But there's an important distinction here. This Hamiltonian term now is proportional to eta, which is proportional to the strength of the source field. So the strength of the source field dictates how this system will evolve to, uh, to have spontaneous parametric down conversion and two photon annihilation processes. So those two processes will occur coherently and the system will evolve deterministically, unitarily, within the Hilbert space composed of the tensor product of the pump and idler Fox states. So what does this look like? If we diagram, draw a diagram, say we start at the top of this diagram, the system could be in some uh, tensor product of some number of idler photons and some number of pump photons, and it'll evolve laterally in this picture, side to side at one level, uh, unitarily just by those processes that I just described but it can also drop down in levels here through non-unitary evolution because that idler field is very weakly uh, contained so it's kind of, it's essentially a constant measurement process going on here that we're watching the idler field and so wave function collapse causes a system to emit photons from the idler field so generally speaking we're going to traverse this ladder to the left, uh, to the right, and down. And as we do so, the rate of that traversal will be dictated by the strength of the source field because, as we said earlier, the TPA process is proportional to the strength of the source field. So the process will ultimately terminate at the bottom right of that diagram. In the diagram shown, we started with an odd number of photons in the pump field, and we ended up with one photon in the pump field. If we had started with an even number, any even number, we would have ended with zero photons in the pump field. So generally speaking, we'll end up in a superposition of one photon in the pump field or zero photons in the pump field. So this means that this process has a 50% single photon generation probability at a rate controllable by the intensity of the signal field, which dictates that, S that down conversion and the TPA process. And also, I haven't mentioned yet that that final generated single pump photon will match the input pump mode as it was not influenced by either of those two, the collapse process. So four-wave mixing finally has further applications in entangled photon generation, uh, optical phase conjugation, that's the reversal of the propagation direction of the source field, supercontinuum generation, that's large-scale spectral broadening for one input mode, we can generate squeeze states with four-wave mixing, and we can generate frequency combs. That's all I have for you today. Here's my references. Thanks for listening.